Welcome to the Living Unconventionally podcast. I'm Brittany Felix, and every Monday I'll be speaking with someone that realized a traditional life with a soul-sucking 9-to-5 job just wasn't for them. They had the courage to go against what society told them they should want, and now they chase their passions all over the world. We'll discuss their unconventional journey and their exciting and sometimes terrifying travels. Every Wednesday we'll continue that conversation by talking about just how they can afford to travel so often and live a life of freedom most people only ever dream of. Every Friday, I'll answer your questions and offer advice and encouragement to help you start living unconventionally. If you allow yourself to be inspired by my amazing guests, one day I may just be featuring you in your world travels. Today I'm continuing my conversation with Kathy O'Dowd, and if you have not listened to part one yet, absolutely stop this recording, stop playing this episode right now, and go listen to it. It is such an incredibly powerful, powerful story of her experience being on Everest during the infamous and tragic 1996 climbing season, as well as her trips to Everest ever since then and just the incredible adventure lifestyle that she has led for the past 20 years. Today, we're going to talk about how she's been able to make that adventure lifestyle possible. She has never once worked a traditional job, which I think is an amazing accomplishment. And as a result of that, she has an incredible wealth of knowledge about living life in an unconventional way, but specifically as it relates to adventure travel. So for any of you out there who are looking to go on expeditions or just these epic adventures and you're not quite sure how to fund them, Kathy's going to provide some resources for you today and some places to get some information and talk about grants and sponsorships, as well as her upcoming project for 2017 that is very specifically about this exact topic. So let's not waste any more time and go ahead and get right on into the interview with Kathy O'Dowd. Well, Kathy, thank you so much for being back on the show. On Monday, we heard your incredibly powerful experiences and your adventure lifestyle. And today I want to talk about how you've been able to make that happen. We talked about the competition for the first Everest team, and you've touched on a little bit of sponsorship, but I would like to know just a little bit more detail about how you've been able to live this lifestyle for 20 years and the ways that you're helping others figure out how to do it as well. Well... How I've managed to actually pay for it comes down to motivational speaking, the corporate speaking circuit. I have managed to sponsor some expeditions. I mean, the the Himalayan ones tend to be too expensive to pay for yourself. But sponsorship, God, it's difficult. It really is. It's just heartbreaking. You just get no, 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 no. And actually... No isn't even the worst of it. The worst of the people who go, oh, that's such a wonderful idea. We'd love to support you. We'll see what we can do. Which actually just means no. Mm -hmm. But you don't know it means no. And you keep on following up with them and and hoping and and trying to say the right thing that will magically unlock it. And what they actually meant all along was good luck, but no. So I've always found asking for sponsorship difficult. And the trouble with sponsorship is... All you've rarely got to offer is media coverage. That's rarely the quid pro quo. I mean, I'm not talking about the kind of sponsorship where they give you some gear or something like that, product. I'm talking about when you need cash. You need big, you know, piles of cash to pay for stuff. And your trade-in with them is media coverage. And at least in, in what I do, Media coverage is tricky because you can't guarantee success. You know, if you can guarantee success on the expedition, then it's not a particularly challenging or groundbreaking expedition. So you have to make the sponsors and the media understand that failure is entirely an option because you are doing things that are difficult and dangerous. You then have to come up with a way whereby you'll have an interesting story to tell even if the expedition doesn't succeed. So that's tricky. And then you've got to try and get both the sponsors and the media to understand that it might go wrong. And the trouble, of course, is the media are quite interested in that. 
if it all turns out to be a, a desperately dangerous disaster, the media is probably going to be all over that. But that's exactly what the sponsor doesn't want. The sponsor wants lots of coverage about your wonderful success story. And, you know, none of this is fully under your control. I don't know, maybe it's easier if you're, I don't know, hiking around the world or something where it's slightly less likely that it might go horribly wrong. <laughs> I don't know. But I've always found this difficult. I found it difficult to ask for money. I always feel as if I'm asking people to pay for me to have a fancy holiday. So <laughs> that's tricky. I find it difficult to sell myself to media, as in, you know, me, me, me. I'm the one who's going to have, me, have this amazing story and you really want to be covering me. God, I think that takes a certain kind of ego, self-confidence, I don't know, to do that well. And I found it quite difficult to manage media when things were going wrong. You know, I've been on various expeditions where things went wrong, and you're in the middle of trying to work out what's going wrong on your expedition. You're also trying to manage public relations. That's hard. So, yes, I've done it. I don't think I do it desperately well, and I don't enjoy it. Then I've done expeditions where we were... We had grants of various kinds, and there's more than you would think, and there, there are more and more. So there are a lot of different places where you can get little bits of money, and that can make the difference, because a lot of expeditions actually aren't desperately expensive. You don't have to be doing 8,000-meter peaks. In, in climbing terms, a lot of the most interesting stuff are unclimbed mountains in the west of China or in the back end of the various stand countries, you know, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, places like that, or, or northern India. And that isn't desperately expensive. So grant money is very useful, but you need to know how to pitch for it. So you still need all that extra skill set about how to sell yourself, how to choose the right project, how to spin a good story, how to then share that story effectively these days via social media. All of this lifestyle, I think, has a strong st storytelling skill set that you need to cultivate. Or you just pay for it yourself, which is a wonderful way to do it, because you owe nothing to nobody. And if you succeed, you can tell people afterwards, and if it doesn't work out, you just shrug and come home again. <laughs> and that is a very nice space to be in. But obviously, the money has to come from somewhere. And it's very tricky to hold down a full-time job and have enough time to be trying to raise sponsorship, trying to raise media coverage, trying to train, then get enough time off to do the expeditions, and then come home and kind of do all the payback that is required if you had sponsors. And there are a few people who make it work, but most of us, I think, simply can't. We have to find a way of earning money while still having a lot more free time. Mm -hmm. And I did that by becoming a motivational speaker. So I use my Himalayan expeditions as case studies to talk to corporate leadership teams about team dynamics, about how you take you know, real ambitious, A-type, driven, competitive, massive ego individuals and try and get them to collaborate <laughs> you know, on high-stress, high-risk projects with really big objectives. And oddly enough, there's quite a lot of crossover between Himalayan climbers and corporate executives. <laughs> right. But that being said, it's not at all easy to get that going as a career. And I had some real lucky breaks that I think would be quite hard to kind of engineer. I, I had some lightning strike strokes of luck which I then did my absolute damnedest to take advantage of and work them really well. I think my speaking career is kind of partly luck, but then once I'd had the lucky break, I very specifically worked the opportunity to try and make sure that I would have a long-lived career as a speaker. It wouldn't just be something you have a couple of opportunities after your big expedition or your, your big adventure. And then after a year or two, nobody's phoning you any longer. So I think that's perhaps the difference in how I did it. Right. Okay. And so I know that you're working on a project in 2017 to help people realize, you know, how adventure is usually paid for. Do you mind talking about that project a little bit? I'd love to. I mean, I've found, because I've been around at this point for 
quite a long time in the adventure space. I get more and more approaches via social media asking about this kind of thing. And you know, I've got, I got one yesterday via Instagram messenger, hitchhiking around the world for two years without money, wrote a book. Now what do I do? How do you do expeditions? How do you fund them? I want bigger things. I was like, wow, that's a big question. <laughs> that's a very big question. But the truth is, I do know how these things are funded. I know a lot of people who do them. And I'm working on putting together a website, an information platform, essentially, about the business of adventure. And this is not so much for the people who want to travel permanently. I think that's a slightly different business model, although there's quite a lot of overlap. I'm in, I'm in the group of people who want to climb and ski and, and do either get adventure sponsored or get themselves sponsored as adventure athletes and make a living that way. And in 2017, I'm going to be setting up this information platform and interviewing a lot of people in the space about what's worked for them and what hasn't, trying to tease out what I think are basically the five or six different ways that you can hunt for funding uh, and income in the space and then have a look at what the top tips are for succeeding in these different ways. And that's a journey that I'd love to share uh, with your group who I think will find value in it. And I'd love to be able to talk to the people in your community as well mm -hmm. about what they're doing, what their problems are, what their successes have been. Because I'm sure there's going to be some great overlap and there'll be some amazing knowledge and resources in your community that I'd love to tap into. Yeah, and I think that would be fantastic. That's one of the reasons I was so excited to have you on here. I always like to provide, you know, new perspectives and unique stories. And obviously, you know, several of my listeners, you know, a lot of them are not going to want to climb Everest or, you know, become an adventure athlete, but there are going to be a few that do. And I love your approach of, you know, just starting now, you don't have to set out hoping to accomplish something, you know, as huge as summiting one of the, you know, highest mountains in the world. But that doesn't mean you can't still have adventure now and you can't still have it if you're working full time. And the money is a huge, huge hang up for a lot of people. So I think anything, you know, even if it's just, you know, one grant or just anything to let them know that there are ways they can make it happen. There are ways to help supplement if they have to put in their own money. And I'm all about people making changes right now that will help them later. So I think learning about this now, and like you said in part one, learning the skills now, starting off small, building those things so that you can pounce on those opportunities when they come is so important. It's absolutely how I've done it. I mean, there do seem to me that to be, there's some people in life who just have such clarity of vision about what they want and such bulldozers type of confidence and motivation that to plow their way through. And I, I'm just not one of them. <laughs> I've made life work by seizing opportunities and then trying to work those opportunities as effectively as possible. But to be able to recognize and then work those opportunities, you need to be quietly building your experience and your skill set all the time. So it's not about Everest. It was never about Everest, but it was always about climbing mountains. And every little mountain brought me that much closer to eventually the, that Everest experience and then all the mountains that followed afterwards because of the way it just opened up doors. Mm -hmm. My approach is absolutely, it's a journey. And what you want to be doing in that journey is building confidence, building experience, and building your skill set. Right. I think absolutely. And so many people get so hung up in the big picture that they forget mm. that to get to that big picture, you have to take a lot of smaller steps. Exactly. I mean, there's a, a quote that comes from a lot of, you know, superstars, singers and stuff. Instant success, 10 years to get to my instant success. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. People see the moment they blazed across, you know, national media. They don't see the years and years of graft that went on before to get yourself ready to take that opportunity. Right. And so do you have an email list or anything that people can kind of follow and know when that website goes live? Yes. The way to do it would be to go to my own website, which is kathyodow.com. If anybody wants to see what a, a motivational speaker adventure website looks like, because the website is targeted at my speaking business, 
have a look, browse through the way I've done it. I do have a email list. It's basically once a month and just some of my thoughts about adventure and how they, they feed into challenges in life in general. Please sign up and there'll be news on there about when my Business of Adventure websites go live and that information starts to come out. So in the meantime, until that website is live, I know that you talked about grants and you said that there were surprisingly you know, more than people realize. Are there any resources that anybody could check out now to learn more about grants or just how to obtain sponsorship or anything like that that you're aware of? Right. My links are quite British European rather than US focused. But I'm going to recommend the nextchallenge.org. That's an adventurer called Tim Moss. He's essentially around the world cyclist, but he, he runs a really good website with information about grants. He actually has a little grant of his own that he offers and lots of articles he's been collecting for years and information about how to set up adventures. The other person I'd like to recommend, the website is alistairhumphreys.com. He was a National Geographic Adventure of the Year back in 2012, also British, adventurer, blogger, author. And he's coined the phrase, at least in Britain, of micro-adventures, encouraging people to treat their weekend as a possibility to have an adventure with a capital A without needing a lot of money. And again, his website has got a lot of resources around organizing adventures, paying for adventures, planning, and that kind of thing. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for this. And, and I'll definitely have those in the show notes as well. One final question here for part two. For anyone who is interested in incorporating more of these, you know, micro adventures or just wanting to incorporate different skills into their lifestyle now, learn different things and build up that toolkit, you know, the metaphorical one that you mentioned in part one, but they're just not quite sure how to go about get starting with that. Do you have any tips for them on how to, to kind of incorporate adventure into their life right now? That's tricky because adventure means kind of very different things to different people. And a lot of it is about where you are in the world and what resources are available to you. I think the most important skill set in our current media environment is the ability to tell stories. Because ever increasingly, it's all about social media and it's about your following on social media. So if you're going to put in a convincing pitch to a sponsor of any kind, the first thing you've got to show them is that you can spin an engaging story about your adventure that will bring in followers. Because these days, basically, they're using adventurers to generate content that can be shared. You are kind of living, breathing, walking content marketing for the sponsors. And to do that, you need to be able to take good photographs, you need to be able to shoot decent video. You need to be able to write. And you need to be able to understand something about structuring of stories. Yeah, if people want to develop their skills, if there are any kind of, I don't know, community college style, after work classes or anything, you spot about storytelling or about photography or video, do those. Get onto YouTube, get onto things like lynda.com or whatever these various adult learning websites and go looking for courses about storytelling or about photography, video, about writing. That is a skill set that a lot of people don't have naturally and it's very useful. The other skill set that of course is very useful is being articulate. It's not just that, you know, the holy grail eventually is being able to give great speeches about your adventures because if you can get into the corporate market, they pay really well. But if you ever make a pitch face-to-face -to, -face to someone who has money, real money, you've got to be articulate about who you are, what you're passionate about, what you want to do, and what that's going to bring back to the sponsor. So, yeah, getting confident about speaking out and articulating what you're all about and what your adventure's about, that's another skill set to work on. And that wraps up my interview with Kathy O'Dowd. For all of you adventure seekers out there, I hope this information was helpful. I will have links to everything that Kathy talked about in today's episode in the show notes on my website. 
You can find those at livinguncomventionally.com forward slash episode 119. Of course, those are the actual numbers, 119. And as I mentioned in Monday's episode, Kathy is a member of the Living Unconventionally Facebook community. So if you have any follow-up questions for her, I highly recommend that you join us in the community and just tag her in a post, and I'm sure that she would be more than happy to answer those. In addition to Kathy, there are almost 450 other members for you to connect with as well. So if you're not a part of that community yet, all you have to do to join is click the link that will be in the show notes I just mentioned, or just simply go to livinguncomventionally.com forward slash Facebook. And it is that time where I want to invite you to come back for this week's Friday solo episode. I figure it's time that I provide a little bit of an update on just what's going on in my life and especially talk about my plans for 2017 for both of my businesses as well as our travel plans. So thank you so much for joining me today, and I cannot wait to have you back on Friday. 